Hi, welcome to Lecture 7, covering Chapter 7 of Focus on Personal Finance. Today our chapter is Selecting and Financing Housing. So this chapter was really interesting to me because my husband and I just purchased our first home here in Hawaii. We've lived here for a little over a year. Um, when we first came to the island, we decided to rent and then recently made the decision to, to purchase a house. It's the fourth time we've owned a home together and we've rented several times through our years together. And each time that we moved someplace, we had to make a decision and at different points in our life, even while we lived there, do we want to rent or do we want to buy a house? We had to look at um, where were we living? what was the market, what was our personal life situation, and then make choices based on whether renting was better for us or whether buying a house was better for us. And those are some of the things that we're gonna look at tonight as we walk through this chapter together. So this chapter provides a complete discussion of selecting housing based on your life situation, your needs, your personal values, along with your related financial aspects, because that's a major uh, expenditure. So. What can you afford? We're going to look at why do you why would you choose to rent and why would you choose to buy? What are the different uh, buying processes? Of course, anytime you go to buy a house, your biggest concern, or ours certainly was, was looking at the financial options available, what kind of mortgages were out there, what are the closing costs, what's the real estate market look like, and we're going to talk about that tonight as well. And then finally, we're going to take a quick look at uh, what to do if you want to sell your home. Let's quickly review our learning objectives for this evening. So learning objective number one, assess costs and benefits of renting. Assess renting and buying alternatives in terms of your financial um, costs and opportunities. We're gonna look at the advantages of renting and then we're gonna look at the disadvantages of renting. And learning objective number two is to implement the house buying process. There are steps that you need to go through as you consider purchasing a home and then walking through the steps. And we're going to walk through those together tonight. Objective number three is to determine costs associated with purchasing a home. It is expensive to buy a home and there are a lot of costs that go with that, including things like your down payment, your mortgage origination fees, your closing costs, uh, prepaid interest, attorney fees, real estate, real estate fees, homeowners insurance and personal property taxes and we're going to look a little more closely at those as we walk through our discussion tonight. And objective number four, develop a strategy for selling a home. Before selling your home you need to look at what repairs or improvements you need to make. Some you can recover your costs on and some you can't. So what do you want to do to make your home more sellable and to get the better price? How to determine your selling price? choosing between using a service, a real estate agent, or selling the house yourself. And we'll look at those strategies as well. So let's get started. Learning objective number one, assess the cost and benefits of renting. People will rent before they purchase a home or have a home built, but that's not always the case. It kind of depends on what your life situation is. We get carried away in the futures of where we would like to live, but the bottom line is, is that where we live and the choices that we have to make normally uh, are governed by how much we can afford to pay, so our uh, financial factors. The rule of thumb is that your house payment or your rent payment should be no more than 25 to 30 percent of your take-home pay, and that's after taxes have been taken out of your earnings. Um, I find that that's difficult here in Hawaii to hit that number, and, uh, and I know that that's probably a challenge for you as well because housing is so high here that sometimes we have to make sacrifices in other areas of our life in order to have the house that we want to live in. And when you go to purchase a home, the rule of thumb is no more than two and a half times your annual income. But once again, here in Hawaii, that can be a stretch. Or moving out on your own for the first time or whether you're at a point where you're just considering buying, you can look at what are the factors of renting versus buying. This slide gives you a really quick breakdown. Of course, renting, you don't have uh, the attachment to where you are that you do when you're buying, because if you're renting, you can move whenever your lease is up or after you're giving notice where when you're buying and you own a home, you have to sell the house before you can move away uh, or you'll have double house payments, which is really scary. When you're renting, someone else takes care of all of the maintenance, those types of things, where when you're buying, if the, the air conditioner goes out or the 
water line breaks, then that's your expense rather than your landlord's. And what can be a really big motivating factor for some people is that when you are buying a house, then that there's a tax uh, break on that where you do not get any tax benefits whenever you are renting. If you're just moving out and you're wanting to find something that doesn't have quite the financial obligation that buying does, or whether you've just moved someplace and you want to get to know that uh, place you're living better and what um, parts of town are better than others or better suited to your lifestyle than others, or um, if you get older and decide that you don't want to have the responsibility of taking care of a house anymore. These are all points in your life that you may choose to rent. So if you're a homeowner now and you think you may never rent, uh, there certainly are certain life obligations or life things that happen um, that could cause you to have to rent at some point again. So let's just go look very quickly selecting a rental property. Decide if you want a, an apartment or a house, and there certainly is a difference in uh, some of the, the bills that go with that, your utilities are usually higher with the house, you may have yard uh, maintenance that you need to take care of um, or do yourself. So those are things to consider where an apartment, those things are normally taken care of for you. Uh, you want to think about where you want to live and what's available in the area that's going to be closest to like where you work, and where you shop, where you go to, uh, to church, if you attend church, those types of things. Whether or not you have pets is also a big consideration because a lot of places that rent either won't allow pets or want a large deposit uh, for each animal that you have or limit you to only having one animal um, so that uh, because they don't want to have to deal with you know, the problems that pets sometimes bring with them whenever they might you know uh, damage the floor or damage part of the house. So you also need to consider the security deposit. A lot of times that's first and last month's rent up front. So that's a lot to have to come up with at, uh, at one time. And then you'll have to pay your first month's rent or your second month's rent then whenever that's due. So sometimes that's a lot to have to come up with. So it can require a large uh, financial commitment to move into a place. And then you also need to make sure that you're aware of what your contract says on your house uh, in regards to, or your apartment in regard to things like um, how much of a notice that you have to give if you're going to move out, if you sign a year lease and you want to move in six months, can you get out of that, do you have to fulfill that, can you sublet, so make sure that you review all of those types of uh, things that are in your contract before signing. So let's say you've rented for a while and now you have decided that you would like to purchase a home. That leads us to learning objective number two, which is implement the house buying process. This, uh, this diagram is on page 225, and you might follow, want to follow along in your book because we're going to step through the house buying process steps. So step number one is to determine home ownership needs. For some people, owning a home is kind of equal to the American dream. Uh, there's pride in home ownership. There are certainly financial benefits because you get to deduct your property taxes and your mortgage in, uh, interest from uh, your taxes. You have an opportunity to uh, build equity in your home and increase the value of your home. So it can be an investment for you. And there certainly is more flexibility to express your individuality when you own your own home than when you're having to abide by uh, renter's guidelines. And as with any decision that we have to make, there are drawbacks of home ownership. There's financial uncertainty. You have to uh, obtain a down payment for the house, and you have to also obtain mortgage financing. And though we hate to think about this, there's always the possibility that there could be a, a change in the property values, and if they go down, that certainly is a drawback. So. There have been a lot of markets where they've had really strong markets and housing was soaring and then something either happens to stabilize the market or the bottom drops out of the market and then people owe more on their houses than what they can sell for them. Uh, they can't, they're in a situation where they're not able to recover what they have invested in their homes and that's a really bad situation to be in. So though it doesn't happen often, it is a risk that has to be considered any time that you're thinking about buying a house since it's such a major purchase. And we did touch on this earlier, but there's limited mobility when you own your home because you can't just give notice and move out. You have to sell your home in order to be able to, um, to be out from underneath the, that monthly payment. 
sometimes that happens quickly and sometimes that can take a while. And then of course those maintenance repair costs, those types of things are going to be your expense as well. So you've considered the pros and cons of buying a home. You've decided that you do want to buy a house. So now the next thing we need to do is to figure out what type of housing do you want to purchase. The most common is the single family dwelling. But there are also multi-unit dwellings such as townhouses or duplexes that you can purchase and own. And then of course very popular here on the island is the condominium. Seeing options that you might not be quite as familiar with are cooperative housing and manufactured homes. So cooperative, excuse me, cooperative housing is a form of housing where um, a building containing a certain number of units is owned by a nonprofit organization and then the members have the right to live in the units by paying, um, paying rent or by purchasing the unit. So a manufactured home is a house that's uh, like prefabricated. It's already, um, been, it's already been created and then the components are separated and sent to you and then you just like put everything together. So it's kind of like a, sometimes maybe called like a kit home. I have not been on the island very long, but I don't know that I've seen any of those here. But uh, where I moved from in the middle of the United States, and I'm from Missouri, uh, you did sometimes see manufactured homes or kit homes. Then we'll also just touch on a mobile home, though once again, not that I've been everywhere on the island, but I'm not seeing any mobile homes here. That's something that you'll see more um, on the mainland. But it's a, uh, it's a bigger than like a mobile trailer, but it basically is built like that. And it's uh, usually less than a thousand square feet. And the thing that is so attractive about them is, is that it's a, usually a fairly inexpensive way to get into a home, but uh, they depreciate rather than appreciating in value, such as other purchases of, of a home and should be safely debated uh, before you make a decision to look at a mobile home because sometimes they're not very safe in bad weather. Something I have considered but never done is to have a home built. So build the home to your own specifications, a, a custom home. You need to be uh, very cautious if you consider doing this and the main reason is because it's very difficult to get in the exact ballpark of what your house is going to cost and overruns are in your expenses are very common. My brother has built a couple of houses um, the main reason is that you get into the house buying process and what has been budgeted is this toilet and what you want when you go pick out the toilet costs a little bit more and then what was budgeted was this these this lighting fixtures which are really crazy about those lighting fixtures and the ones that you really want cost a little bit more and then whenever you go to put in the bathtub that's not really the bathtub you wanted or the kitchen counters that you wanted, or I really would like to have uh, granite countertops instead of what was uh, budgeted. And so then just little by little, each one of these items add more and more to the value of building the house, the cost of building the house, and then you end up um, owing more on the custom home than what you meant to. Uh, it's really difficult to uh, manage those expenses, and then sometimes there are miscalculations on what things cost, uh, such as, as your labor. So though building a custom home can be a lot of fun, um, and I certainly enjoyed watching my brother go through the process, it can also be very scary uh, in trying to manage your, your budget. You've decided what kind of home that you want to purchase. Now the next thing you need to do is to find and evaluate the home. And I'm sure you've heard this a million times. Uh, it's often the joke of, uh, of TV sitcoms, but it's all about location, 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 and that is true whenever you're choosing your home as well. You need to be aware of zoning laws in a, uh, for a house that you're looking at purchasing. Zoning laws are restrictions on how the property and an area can be used. You also need to be aware of whether or not the house you're looking at purchasing um, has a homeowner association, and if they have a homeowner association, what are uh, the rules? What can you do and what can you not do? Where we lived uh, on the mainland, we had a homeowners association that did not allow basketball hoops in the front yard, which was a popular thing for people to shoot hoops with the kids uh, in their drive, like in their driveway after uh, work in the evening. And our homeowner association did not allow for the basketball hoops in the front in the front of the house. They had to be behind the house, so you couldn't use your slab of concrete where you park your car as the basketball court. 
and that was a real dissatisfier to uh, us and to our kids. You also need to know about the school system that's in that neighborhood. A lot of families have children, and if you don't have children and you're not concerned about the schools, you have to consider that whenever you go to resell your home, uh, chances are the people who buy your house may either have children or want to have children, and schooling will be important to them. So make sure that you know the information about the school that your kids will attend and uh, how that's rated, how popular that is, those types of things. Working with a real estate agent is a great way to have access to uh, lots of houses and the information about those homes. They'll show the homes to you. They'll uh, set up the meeting times with the other realtors and whenever you are ready to make an offer, they will help you to come up with an offer that's fair. They'll present your offer. They'll help you with the price negotiating. They'll make recommendations for obtaining financing and then they'll also just walk you through all of the steps up to closing and then they should also represent you at closing. So real estate agents can really help you in the house uh, buying process. And the thing that I want to call to your attention is, is that you're not paying for the real estate fees. The person who's selling the house pays for those. Once you've found the house that you want to purchase, before uh, reaching your final decision, you should conduct a complete evaluation of the property. This home inspection can be uh, Help, can help you minimize future problems and you can also purchase uh, services to someone to come and actually go through the house completely. I know that whenever we bought the house that we're living in right now, we paid for a home inspector. He spent like four or six hours here and went through everything and then spent another hour, hour and a half with us and just went over every single thing with us and told us what things had been done, what things might be a problem, what things needed to be done, what things we needed to do to maintain the home, and I found that to be incredibly helpful. Once you're in the home buying process, the mortgage company will require an appraisal, and they also may require a home inspection as well. The house, you've done your home inspection, you feel like this is the one that you want, what are the next steps? The next thing you need to do is to determine the home price. What do you want to offer for this house? One of the main factors in determining the selling price in an area is what are the houses around you in the same uh, area selling for. It has an impact on um, how your home price is evaluated. They're also going to look at the current demand for housing. Is the housing market a seller's market, a buyer's market? Is it strong? How long the house has been on the market will impact um, what you might want to offer for it. You're also going to learn as much as you can about the people who have the house presently and what is their need to sell. So if someone's been transferred and they've got to sell the house in the next 30 days, that puts a lot of pressure on, our, on an owner and might be to your advantage to get a better price. Um, you need to look at your financing options and make sure that you um, know what your price point is in regards to what you can offer as well as how much money you can afford to pay in a monthly payment. And considering all of these things will help you to come up with what you want to offer for a home. You're, and once again, if you work with a real estate agent, she should be able to help you hone in on that. So step number three is to uh, price the property. So if you're working with a real estate agent, she's going to prepare that offer and give it to the seller. And then let's say just for round numbers, you you offered the house was priced at five hundred and twenty-five thousand, and you offered five hundred and ten thousand. So then it's not uncommon for the person who's selling it to say, well, I won't sell it for five hundred and ten thousand, but I might sell it for five hundred and fifteen thousand. Then you can decide, can I go the extra five thousand? Um, they're trying to meet me halfway. This looks like a good deal, and then you can um, accept the offer. But counter offering is not uncommon. If it's been accepted, you need to be prepared to make a deposit of earnest money. This is basically just kind of like um, saying, yes, I'm going to give you this money. I'm serious about this house. I'm serious enough that I'm going to write you a $5,000 check to say, yes, I want to do business with you. And then that check, uh, that earnest money is held uh, normally by your uh, closing company. Sometimes there's a contingency clause meaning that I'm going to make this offer to you and agree, yes, I'll pay you $515,000 for this house, but it's based on a couple of things. First of all, I have a house and I need to sell it. So as long as my house sells, then I will um, accept this offer. 
then also I'm going to have to be able to obtain uh, financing that I can afford. So if you'll accept this contingent on these off on these items, then I'm willing to make the offer. Now, one of the things that I will tell you is that if I'm selling a home to you and I'm giving you my best bottom dollar and you want me to be contingent on a sale of your home, that's going to delay my timetable and that may not work in your favor. So just things to be aware of. And a couple more things that I wanted to make sure that I explained just a little more clearly. I mentioned earlier whether it's a seller's market or a buyer's market. So in times of high demand for housing, um, sometimes it's referred to as a um, seller's market. Since the homeowner is likely to have several offers for the sale of the property, meaning that they're going to be able to be a little bit more picky about who that they sell the house to because they've got lots of different um, options to sell the house. And because they may have so many customers, they're going to be a little bit more picky about the offer that they do choose because if they don't like your offer, chances are someone else is going to come along and offer them what they want. So in contrast, um, when home sales are slow, it becomes what's called a buyer's market, meaning that now as a buyer, you have the advantage because uh, there are more homes on the market that need to be sold and there are buyers in the market to sell to buy them. So I'm going to be a little bit more generous whenever I get an offer because I know that if you don't like what I offer you or if I'm difficult to work with, there's another house three doors down that's for sale and you're going to go down there and buy from him. So you'll often hear those terms a buyer's market or a seller's market and you need to know which kind of a market it is. Uh, if you are buying or selling your home so that you know uh, where you stand on that playing field. Which brings us to learning objective number three, determine cost associated with purchasing the home. So in addition to what the house is going to cost you, uh, what are the things that you're going to spend in obtaining your financing? So you've already paid out your earnest money and that will come up, will be like added, taken off of your total ticket whenever you go to pay uh, for the house at closing. But you'll also need to come up with a down payment. Now your down payment most likely uh, will be determined by whatever type of loan that you take out. Different types of loans have different requirements, whether it's uh, a, maybe a special deal where you can get like 5% down or 10% down, and then these are the interest rates that apply. Uh, the more that you put down, usually the better interest rate that you can get. But there is a break point at a 20% down, and the reason is because if you uh, pay down less than 20%, you're going to have to pay on top of your all of your other expenses, what's called PMI, or um, stands for private mortgage insurance. So let's just say, for ease of math, you ended up buying that house for um, at, for $100,000. And though I don't expect you to buy a house for $100,000, it's just easier, I think, since we're doing this verbally to follow along. So you buy a house, it's $100,000 you've got to put $20,000 down as a down payment. And this is in addition to uh, what you're going to spend on uh, closing costs, okay? So you got to put down $20,000 in order to not have to pay out the PMI insurance. Now, though that's a big amount to have to pay down, especially if you're a first-time homeowner, if there's any way possible to come up with 20% down, it's recommended that you do because the uh, PMI insurance is costly. So it's basically saying that if you would default on the loan, it's it's uh, an insurance there that, that insures the lender against loss. Depending on the amount of your loan, it can add quite a bit to your monthly payment. Um, I'm trying to think if I can tell you something realistically about that, but let's just say, and this is just an estimation, but on a, a home loan that's maybe 250000 you might pay as much as an additional $100 a month on PMI. And now that I said that, I wish I hadn't said that. I'm trying to recall, and I may not be recalling very accurately, like one of the houses that we owned in uh, for one of our homes and when we were in the mainland, we had to have, we were newly married, and so we had to have PMI insurance, and it was uh, quite high compared to what our monthly payment was. And so now that I've given you a dollar amount, I'm feeling very uncomfortable about that. So let's just say that it can add considerably to your to your house payment. Uh, the good news is that once you get to where you own uh, greater than 22% of your home, then that uh, PMI insurance has to be terminated. But during the time that you're building up that percentage of equity, you are paying that additional amount 
of, uh, of insurance. And so you want to be aware of that, know what you're paying for that, and make decisions on your down payment accordingly. Mortgage is a long-term loan on your specified piece of property that you're purchasing. And mortgages are typically 15 and 30 years, though you can get terms at 10, uh, 20, 25 as well. To qualify for a mortgage, you must meet criteria for that loan. And the major factors that are going to affect the affordability of the mortgage that you can qualify for are your income, how much money that you make, um, and how long you've been in that job, what other debts you have, what amount that you were able to put down as a down payment or you'll be able to, how long you want to take the loan out for, and then what are the current mortgage rates. All of these are going to impact the amount of your monthly payment. So once you have chosen the loan that you want and you know the information, how much uh, down payment you need, how long it's going to be for, what your mortgage rate is, and you're comfortable with what that's going to cost you each month, then you complete your application with your lender, and then you provide for them an incredible amount of evidence of what you qualify for. And like I said, we just went through this and we could not believe all of the stuff that we had to provide to them and how far back sometimes that they go, but um, they're going to want to verify all of your money, any of your checking, savings, retirement accounts, those types of things. They're going to want to verify employment. They're going to want verification of how much money that you earn. They're going to want verification on every debt that you have. Uh, so just be prepared. It is quite the paper drill. So in addition to verifying all the information on your application, we also talked about your credit score, and this lender will absolutely pull your credit report and look at that. If there's any questions or issues, they're going to talk to you about that. Um, and you may have to write a letter and explain anything that's on there that's, uh, that is not uh, outstanding so that they can understand what happened if you ever missed a payment or anything like that. So then your mortgage is usually either approved or denied within, um, within usually uh, 60 days. And what a lock is that locks in your interest rate for 60 to 90 days. So uh, why that's important is that once you make the application and you say, okay, I've chosen, I want the 30-year loan, and uh, here's all of the ins and outs of what that is, and yes, this is the loan that I want, and then they lock that price in, and that's good for while you're going through this process of getting your loan approved, so it's called locking in at that rate. But until you tell your lender, yes, this is the loan that I want, and this is it, you're not locked in at that rate, and you go to bed one night, and you wake up the next morning, and there's been a fluctuation in interest rates, which happens very frequently, and then you find out that, that loan you thought you were going to get at 4% is now 4.25%, which is a huge jump, and can certainly negatively impact the amount of payment that you need to make. So you want to lock in your interest rate at the lowest possible uh, amount, and uh, usually that means as quickly as possible. Make sure that you know about uh, your mortgage. The lower the interest rate, usually the higher the amount that you can qualify for, and the reason is because it's really amazing on a home loan because it's such a large amount how much just even like uh, an eighth of a percent can make in your monthly payment. So as your interest rate is lower, then you have a lower payment, therefore you can qualify for a higher amount. Part of your uh, of your mortgage loan closing process is to pay points, and I want to make sure that we cover that so that you know what you're paying. So points are prepaid interest that's charged by the lender. So each discount point is actually equal to 1% of the loan amount that you're taking out, and it should be viewed as a premium being, uh, being paid to obtain a lower mortgage rate. So whenever you see what your the loan is that you're getting, you need to make sure that you know what your uh, how many points that you're paying for the loan. And you're also going to pay an application fee. So uh, even though it seems like you're the one that is having to do all the work when you're pulling up all of this information to give to them about every financial aspect of your life, um, the lender is going to charge you an application fee between $100 and $300 to process the loan and verify all that information. You're going to also uh, have to pay a loan origination fee, your property appraisal fee, and then there's also going to be a charge on the credit report that they pulled for you. All of those things will be in your closing costs when you go to make your uh, to sign your loan and make all the closing arrangements. The different types of mortgages. There's a chart on page 232 of your book that compares the benefits and drawbacks of the different types of loans. 
and though we'll hit the highlights here, you may want to take time to fully review this um, information because it's really very valuable. So up first is the conventional 30-year fixed loan. This is uh, most common, especially for first-time homeowners, and it has equal payments over whether you choose 15 years or 30 years or however many years, it's fixed payments over the life of the loan, and it has a fixed interest rate, meaning let's just say that you bought the ha that you with the time that you closed, you selected a 4% interest rate, it's fixed, 4%. That's what you're gonna pay for the entire 30 years if you take out a 30-year loan. It's never gonna change. It's a guarantee that that's what you're gonna pay for the life of the loan. If you choose a lesser loan, you can usually get a better interest rate. So I'm sorry, not a lesser loan, a lesser time uh, repayment period. So a 15 year fixed loan is gonna offer you a better interest rate than a 30 year fixed. And once again, the reason is because there's less risk for the, for the lender. He knows you're gonna pay that back over a period of 15 years. It's easier to estimate what uh, the future is over 15 years than over 30, so there's less risk. Therefore, you get the benefit by getting a better interest rate. Other types of loans that you may qualify for are VA, which is the Veterans Administration Home Loan, or FHA, which is Federal Housing Authority. These loans normally require less down payment than what a conventional loan does, but they also have other requirements. Sometimes the home has to meet a certain level of, uh, of repair. So you need to be aware, uh, first of all, if you qualify for a VA or FHA loan, uh, if you do, I would encourage you to investigate that because you can normally get better rates, but then also know uh, what's required of a home that's going to be used with VA or FHA funds because normally they have to be a higher level of repair than just a home that you might otherwise choose. The loan is called an ARM or an Adjustable Rate Mortgage, and I want to make sure that we cover this fairly thoroughly because it can be a very attractive loan, because normally the interest rate is less than on a conventional, um, but there are some drawbacks, and you need to understand uh, what these loans are designed for so that you make sure that you, are, if you choose that, you're choosing that for the right reasons and that it fits your situation. So. So an ARM is sometimes referred to as a flexible rate mortgage or a variable rate mortgage. It has an interest rate that increases or decreases during the life of the loan based on changes in the market interest rate. So these loans you typically take out for a shorter period of time. Uh, time periods are usually one, three, five, seven, or 10 years. So you're gonna take it out for a lesser amount of time and then at the end of the time that you took out the loan for, you're gonna to have to refinance the house or pay that off. So that's one of the reasons why you need to be really careful with the adjustable rate mortgage. Um, it's not for the, for like long-term, it's for like short-term. So if you only plan to, you, to own the house for a few years and then you know you're gonna sell it, it might be a good option for you. But where the conventional loan is fixed over the life of the loan, this loan is not. It is an adjustable rate, meaning that the interest rate is going to vary over the, the life of the loan. So you need to know what the stipulations are on the loan as to how much it can go up, when it can go up. Uh, if the interest rates go down, it can go down as well, but don't hold your breath on that. Um, you need to consider what would be worst case scenario when taking out one of these loans because you don't want to get yourself in a situation where you can't meet the house payment that you have because uh, your payment went up to an amount that you can't afford. So some of the factors that you're going to find in looking at these loans is that there's a rate cap, which means that it restricts the amount of the change in the rate that uh, that you can that it can go up. So let's just say your payment is fifteen hundred dollars a month, that it restricts that. In, one, in a, like a two-year period, it can't go up more than $500. So it limits the amount. Um, I'm sorry, that's a payment cap. I said that backwards, payment cap. That's restricting the amount of the payment, how much it can go up. The rate cap also restricts how much of an increase you can, you can go up in your, uh, in your loan percentage. So let's say that you take out the loan and it's very attractive. You got a 3% interest rate but uh, then the cap says how much can the interest rate go up and over the amounts of time that it can go up. So the thing that you need to be really careful about is that you don't have negative amortization. And how that happens is that you have a um, 
a payment cap saying that your payment can't go up more than $500 in over a two-year period, but your interest rate jumps up from 3% to let, let's just say uh, it goes up to 5 or 7%. Well, if you recalculated your house payment at the higher amount, it's actually more than what the payment cap allows you to make as a monthly payment. Therefore, the difference in what you're not paying back gets added to your loan. So the amount of your loan is not being paid down, it's actually going up. So you're able to stay in the house because you have a restriction on how much they can charge you each month towards your loan, but your loan is growing rather than getting smaller, which can make a lot of problems when you try to go and sell your house. So once again, adjustable rate mortgages can be very attractive because they lower, they offer a lower uh, percentage of interest on your home loan but you need to make sure that you understand your rate cap, uh, your payment cap, the, the life of the loan, how long you can have that for, and that what you plan to do with the house meets the, the criteria of that loan in a way that will work to your advantage rather than to your disadvantage. Of the home buying activity is to close your purchase transaction. So the very last thing that you're going to do is, is a walkthrough. This is a last minute items for negotiation. You're gonna walk through the house uh, with your real estate agent and look at every single thing and make sure that you are um, ready to make the final purchase, that any repairs that you agreed upon have been made to your satisfaction, and that you're ready to say, yes, here's uh, the check for the house. And then you're going to schedule your closing and go to your closing with uh, your real estate agent. If you don't use a real estate agent, uh, you may use a lawyer. So the seller will also be there as well as the lender. All of the parties are at one table. You're going to sign all of the documents that need to be signed and talk about any last minute details. You're going to pay whatever uh, you had to pay out of pocket for the closing costs, which is called settlement costs. You'll know those in advance and know how much money you'll have to bring in cash. That earnest money, like let's say your closing costs just around numbers was $10,000, you paid $5,000 down in earnest money, then you only need to bring $5,000 to the closing because you've already paid a portion of that. No point in the world made up the $10,000 in closing costs, and I'm not going to go through these because we've touched on a lot of these already, but these are all the different things that you'll be paying for at closing, and uh, depending on the amount of your home loan and uh, the loan that you choose, um, yeah, the amount sometimes can be very surprising in what you need to bring for closing costs. Um, and I want to try to wrap up this lecture, but I did want to... Uh, mentioned the escrow account. So your escrow account is money that's deposited with your lending institution and then they pay your payment uh, for your taxes and your insurance on your home. And they do this to make sure that those items get paid. Um, and then it's also easy for you because they just take that amount and divide it by 12 and add that to your payment and then you're paying a little bit each month with your payment rather than having to come up with taxes at the end of the year or insurance whenever it's due. In objective number four, developing a strategy to sell your home. So the very first thing that you want to do is go through your house and do anything that needs to be done in the ways of like uh, repainting or uh, repairs, not major but minor, and then uh, make sure that your house is clean. And the biggest thing that you can do is to reduce clutter. So we all have things that are piled up uh, everywhere in the bottom of our closets. Uh, we have way too many things out and the stuff is stuck everywhere. The more that you can make the house look clean and simple, the bigger the rooms look, therefore uh, the better that it shows. So you want to, uh, to do all of these things to prepare your house for sale. Now, you can really do a lot of things to a house, especially if you start looking at repairs and repainting. Um, and so if you're going to go with a, home, with a real estate agent to sell your house, you need to have them come over and look at your house before you list it and to just tell you what it is that they think that you need to do to bring the best dollar. So it's just like if you go to sell a car, you want the car to be clean. You know, you don't want to put a for sale sign in a car that hasn't been washed for three weeks and hasn't been vacuumed out for 10 weeks and uh, you haven't wiped down the dashboard forever. You're going to take and detail that car and make it look really great because it's going to bring you a better price. And that's going to be the same with your house. But what you don't want to do is spend money that you're not going to recover. So let's say that you decide you want to repaint the entire house and so you repaint the entire house a beautiful shade of brown. Well, not everybody likes brown and brown may not be the best uh, color for your home and so you may have just spent all of this money doing something 
that is not going to add value to your home, even though you like it, somebody else might not like it. Um, you don't want to do things like replace your, your appliances. If your real estate agent says you're fine with the ones that are in there, but she may say your dishwasher is so old, you need to replace that. He or she, your real estate agent is an expert and they can tell you, do these things and it's going to add to the value of your house. Don't do these things because you, if you do them, you're not going to regain it when you go to sell the house. So use your real estate agent as the expert. You're paying that person a percentage of the sale of your home for selling it. And uh, this is one of the areas of expertise that can certainly help you to get a return on that investment. When, when you show the house and your real estate agent, once again, should help you to do this, but you need to stage it. You need to turn on all of your lights and open up all your draperies. If you can do something in the house that's uh, homey smelling, like baking bread or cookies, so that when people come in, there's cookies on the counter for them to enjoy one. It smells like home. Those kinds of things actually help your house to, uh, to sell better because it feels homey, it uh, looks bright and clean and inviting, and, uh, and then that's something that will keep your owner, people who are looking at the house, they'll think, oh, this feels like a home, which is what they're out to buy. So this is our last slide. This will, uh, wrap, this will wrap up our lecture this evening. But putting a price on your home is probably one of the hardest things that you'll do because you love your home and you want it to bring lots of, uh, you know, you want to have a good return on your investment. Your real estate agent should help you to come up with a uh, realistic appraisal of what the current value is of your home. That's based on lots of different things, including what the current market is. Uh, but to utilize, once again, the, the services that you're purchasing whenever you hire a real estate agent. If you decide to do for sale by owner, you need to do your homework to find out what homes in your area have been selling for and how they compare to your house to help you to come up with a realistic selling price. You also need to uh, use a lawyer or a title company to help you with all of the different closing uh, closing costs and those types of, of uh, legal items. And then just a couple of really quick notes about if you want to choose a real estate agent, uh, the, I'm always a big fan of the internet. It can tell you how many homes that that real estate agent has sold uh, over the last year, what their rating is, what their customer ratings are, Friends and family, always a great way to get recommendations uh, on real estate agents. You want someone who uh, knows what they're doing. So though it's sometimes easy to say, oh, hey, Fran just got uh, her real estate license. Why don't you let her sell your house? And if Fran's a really good, good friend of yours, then I'll let you make that choice. But uh, you, you want somebody to, that really knows the market, knows the business to work for you in selling your home. Uh, because they're going to know the ups and downs, the ins and outs, and what you need to do. So make sure that you get someone who's experienced, who has good references, good recommendations, and who has a good track record for, um, for helping you to sell your home. All right, so the full deck of slides are uh, out there for you, for you, and I, I would encourage you to review those as you study, read through the chapter, uh, if you haven't done that already. And, of course, we also have a few supplemental videos um, that, that I posted for you that will help you with understanding the information presented here today. And as always, I'm available. You have, you have my information on the syllabus, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Until next week.